Dzień dobry, nazywam się Joanna Becker, jestem wiceszefową polityki Insight i zapraszam na rozmowę, które nagraliśmy podczas naszej konferencji Ryzyka i Trendy. Z naszymi gośćmi dyskutowaliśmy o przyszłości demokracji i mediów, o suwerenności i Europie, o globalnych zagrożeniach i potrzebie bezpieczeństwa, o gospodarce i klimacie. W naszych rozmowach wskazujemy najważniejsze trendy, zerkamy w przyszłość, próbujemy uporządkować rzeczywistość. Stawiamy pytania, unikamy dogmatów i szukamy drogowskazów. There will have been changes induced by this crisis that will be there to last and that will be there to affect us for a much longer period of time. And the most important one of those is the change of guard and the change of power, the transfer of power, the growth and growing assertiveness of China. I think one should define as the airplanes define. If you have the masks coming down in a case of oxygen failure in a plane, The flight attendant will tell you, please put the mask over your nose, then take care of your neighbor. So I think there is a definition of internationalism that needs to be more realistic and more congruent with human nature. I think that the Chinese, especially the Chinese military, want a conflict. And so I think it's a possibility within five years, not a probability, but a possibility. Great power competition prevents great power conflict. And that means you have to compete in diplomacy, with information, and with the military, and with economic means. You have to demonstrate the ability to inflict really terrible punishment on an attacker. That's what deterrence is all about. They have to see that we are ready to unleash hell on them if they ever did attack. Siła państw zazwyczaj kojarzona ze sferą wojskową. Nagle zaczęła być mierzona ilością zapasów medycznych, sprawnością logistyki oraz poziomem rozwoju nauki i medycyny. Thomas Kleine Brokow, dyrektor biura German Marshall Fund w Berlinie, zastanawia się, czy 2020 rok nieodwołalnie zmienił światowy porządek i czy wyłoni się nowy ład. A generał Ben Hodges mówi o możliwym starciu amerykańsko-chińskim. Rozmowy prowadzi Marek Świerczyński, szef działu bezpieczeństwa i spraw międzynarodowych polityki Insight. My guest in this conversation is Thomas Kleine Brockhoff, Vice President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and Head of its Berlin office. Thomas is one of the leading voices in transatlantic security debate in Germany, in Europe and between the old continent and the United States. I've met Thomas a few years ago and I was lucky to take part in many events, conferences and workshops where I've learned that he always offers in-depth, very thoughtful, mature analysis of events and trends, as well as excellent, sharp and remarkably bright conclusions, with a pinch of optimism, so much needed in this gloom time of pandemic world. So, Thomas Kleine Brokhoff, welcome to Politica Insights Risks and Trends 2021. Thank you, Marek, also for this very kind introduction. Happy to have you with us. For the start, let's take a few steps back from the headlines, policies and politics. And let's look in people's minds. Let's compare the two shocks that we've witnessed in the recent few years. 2014 was a year of shock in terms of military aggression happening just outside our borders, at our doorstep frightful, especially to those who live near the aggressor, but not necessarily so to the rest of Europe, let alone the rest of the world. This time it is much different. The year 2020 brought the real and present danger to everyone's life. And instantly this was reflected in opinions. The most feared security threat was immediately related to the pandemics, health systems, illness prevention and care, not those related to military issues which were so dominant not long time ago. And also the climate catastrophe was sort of marginalized in the threat perception polls. Is this change an element of this shock which will pass as soon as the pandemic eases Or could it permanently change people's thinking and also the political decision about what does it mean to be secure? In other words, how deep will be the impact of 2020? Essentially, there is a number of schools on this question. One of the schools is sort of, let's call it the 9-11 school. 
So the world has permanently changed. This is a fork in the road. Nothing will ever be the same from the way we communicate to the way we interact politically with each other. The second school is the Trent Accelerator School. The, this incident, the coronavirus, accelerates already existing trends. And then there is a smaller school who will say that at some point the quality of a gradual change accelerating existing changes is qualitatively so different that we find ourselves in a new world. Let me say something counterintuitive. There are elements where the current crisis will, in my view, play less of a role than we currently think. We had forgotten all about the Spanish flu in 1919, 1920, because what we remember is World War I, but not the Spanish flu. We also don't remember that the Roaring Twenties that followed have something to do with the combination of the two and a burst of optimism and joy in life. I see an element of snapback that we will have once we have the vaccine effective globally, which will might take another year or even more. But there is the trend accelerator that will be with us because there will have been changes induced by this crisis that will be there to last and that will be there to affect us for a much longer period of time. And the most important one of those is the change of guard and the change of power, the transfer of power, the growth and growing assertiveness of China. You can call it a trend accelerator, but I would call it a war in a new dimension. Because what we have seen in this 2020 was alliances cracking, great powers declining, and governments, even the super rich governments of nations and blocks of nations, all of a sudden caught dependent on very basic but crucial supplies. And what we have seen is competition growing even though at times we could see cooperation expanding. So tell me, is this a manifestation of a new dimension of international competition or is it something that would actually strengthen cooperation? Yes, you would think that a pandemic is the ultimate example of international cooperation because only through international cooperation can you beat the virus and only if we beat it everywhere will have beaten it somewhere but what we see is the opposite we have seen peak globalization a couple of years ago now we see an acceleration of deglobalization the eu's decision this past week to enact export controls for vaccines is part of that story. The initial border closures, unilateral border closures, not cooperative border closures, are part of that story as well. And the question now is whether we will go towards protectionism and autonomy and finally autarky. Those are the terms that describe the slippery slope. Or whether we go towards something that Pascal Las Lamy has termed precautionism, that does accept globalization, that does accept the division of labor as a principle, but that does, on the other hand, sort of question the principle of just in time delivery and therefore talks about stockpiling, talks about a broader array of distribution sources a broader sourcing that keeps globalization alive, but combines it with the idea that there can be shocks to the system and that one has to be prepared to deal with the shocks to the system. So I would hope the latter is where we're going, but clearly the European Union is a good example of a roller coaster ride between the two. Now, I don't think, and I'll close with that thought, that internationalism should be defined that you vaccinate somebody else before you vaccinate your own people. If that is the threshold of internationalism, internationalism is going to necessarily fail. I think one should define as the airplanes define. If you have the masks coming down in a case of oxygen failure in a plane, the flight attendant will tell you, please put the mask over your nose, then take care of your neighbor. 
So I think there is a definition of internationalism that needs to be more realistic and more congruent with human nature than what we sometimes expect of ourselves. It is impossible to discuss the impact of 2020 in terms of security perceptions without looking at America, the world's superpower, who is wounded, bleeding, and at times at the verge of revolution. The contrast between the bombastic rhetoric of the last four years and the collapse of the system as we've seen it, primarily the death toll, was striking not only for the outside lookers, the rest of the world, but also it must have been a wake-up call for many Americans. Is there going to be a reflection on the other side of the Atlantic about what does it mean to really be secure and what does it really mean to be the most powerful nation in the world? I do think that the American mind will have a more long-lasting effect of this than other countries. But the question is how. Some people argue that this is an attack on the idea of American exceptionalism. It is certainly something that undermines the American model of global leadership and global leadership as an exemplary country. That, I think, will be affected. And it also tells Americans who have a history of extreme changes from one outlook to the other and also of mood changes, as you said it in your question of a bombastic rhetoric of grandiose achievement to complete self-assessment of failure. We've seen that multiple times over the last decades, including post-Vietnam War. But it also tells you that America usually recovers from these waves of collective depression that clearly America is in now. Based on what we said just moments ago, it seems legitimate to say that this may emphasize the trends in America which lead to more isolationism, more inward-looking policies. We used to think that isolationist ideas in the United States were sort of automatically linked to the presidency of Donald Trump in the past four years. But is it really so? We have to take into account that there is an element of self-sufficiency in the American collective mind that is popular in America that we've seen re-emerge over the last years. But the question is that isolationism or will it lead to isolationism or is it the correction of a previous overreach? Because the unilateral moment that we recall is the first time in world history in which there was liberal hegemony, that there was the ability of the liberal democracy to call the shots globally led by the United States. Now that was a very short, very brief, and one could arguably say not very successful moment. And that we are now seeing an element of correction that is limitation. Of course that is driven by sort of an isolationist core. Will it lead to isolationism, I'm not so sure, because the slogan with Joe Biden, Build Back Better, also applies in his mind to alliances. He wants to build back the alliances better. Precondition of that is that you have a trusted, trustworthy, and functioning government at home. So what I see is rather not an American problem, but I see a Western problem. I see the same erosion of trust in our governments and the same sense of overstretch in many of our democratic societies. I believe we're in that same boat together. Let's get back to Europe, which may have been less wounded by the pandemic than America, but which will face equally important dilemmas about its security. Everybody in Europe seems to be aware that Europe needs to do more, more swiftly, more cohesively in dealing with health threats, as well as there is a growing realization that Europe needs to generally do more for its defense. This is also the major subject of transatlantic discussions. America's growing engagement and focus on Asia, which results or may result in less engagement and less presence in Europe. And let's face it, the growing disagreements, strategic disagreements about the role of Europe in the global sphere versus or with the United States. All these combined seem to be pushing Europe to go its own way, maybe not yet 
go alone. Is it possible to keep the transatlantic bond on one hand and have some strategic autonomy on the other? Or will Europe inevitably over time become a competitor to the United States? No, I don't believe that's our future. We, we shouldn't want this to be our future. I'm not a very happy camper when it comes to the term strategic autonomy and European sovereignty. If sovereignty means capability and ability to act, I'm fully on board. We need to do that in order to be a good partner of the United States, to even be useful to the United States and be useful to ourselves, more importantly. But capability and capacity and willingness and ability to act are different from sovereignty. Sovereignty runs the danger, at least as conceived of by those who propose it, of putting Europe into a strategic no man's land, somewhere between China, Russia and the United States. And that, I think, is the danger of the concept. So I think it's an ill-conceived idea that gets us nowhere. We need to think about our own ability to act in unison and our own ability to act in unison together with the United States. Just as I believe that there is no problem that the United States has alone, that we have shared problems, I believe believe that the solution to these problems will come from Western democracies and not from singling out Europe. And without a solution to our deep crisis of trust within our populations, within the biggest and largest and most traditional of our democracies, I also think we will find a good solution in Europe itself. I know that you are not a fan of this term strategic autonomy, and forgive me, it may have been a little provocation from my side to allow you to express your criticism of the term. But I would like you to help me decipher the other part of this equation. Equation. That is, what does it mean that Europe needs to do more on security and defense? Exactly who should do what, when, and in what sense more? I think what we need is a new consensus and a new bargain transatlantically. America renews with the new presidency its commitment to European defense. And that is largely an Article 5 commitment but it also has a nuclear component of nuclear sharing, of deterrence. While the Europeans take on the task of, I don't call it burden sharing, I would like to call it burden shifting. The Europeans need to be able to do two things. One is to deter conventional attack on the European homeland, and that is conventional homeland territorial defense. And the burden of that goes to the larger European land-based countries, and I mean my own country first and foremost. Now, that is the country most lacking that commitment and lacking that insight and lacking the willingness to make progress quickly. It has made progress. It has made even significant progress in turning the tide but nowhere close to what is necessary. I always feel that the Germans are moving, but the environment is moving faster. So the gap, gap keeps growing, even though the Germans feel they are moving. But it's not just a German phenomenon. When you look at the smaller European countries, they often hide in their defense quotas behind Germany. There's only very few countries who actually do what they've promised to do in Europe. So we need to be able to do that in order to relieve America of some of its duties in Europe. That, by the way, also means some adjustment of its perspective on the part of Poland. It needs to become more reliant on its European partners, and the European partners also need to provide that. So I think that in conventional terms, that's the deal. And the second part of the deal concerns China. I think there is different interests overlapping but in some elements, different interests vis-a-vis -vis China in Europe than in the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. But we can converge on those. We, I think, need to accept that there are security caveats and technology caveats to our trade with China. And America needs to accept that from a European perspective, two things are important. One, a complete decoupling is unrealistic and probably dangerous. 
And the European defense commitment to China is a far-fetched idea. But what we should want to do is support and understand and do no harm to the American concern vis-a-vis China. So there needs to be an alignment on China that respects these differences in national and continental interests. Thank you, Thomas, for this. Thank you for this conversation. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, sir. My second guest in the security block of this year's Risk and Trends Conference is a retired three-star U.S. Army General Frederick Ben Hodges. Lieutenant General Hodges spent almost 40 years in uniform, and his last military assignment was as commanding general of the U.S. Army Europe, exactly at the time when NATO and the U.S. forces in Europe had to reform and adapt to new reality caused by Russia's aggression and non-military malign activities. Now, Mr. Hodges holds a strategic studies position in Washington-based think tank SIPA, named after one of the greatest American generals, Joseph John Pershing, and looks far beyond Europe, to Asia, to Arctic, to the Indo-Pacific, and of course, to China. So, General Hodges, welcome to Politica Insights Risk and Trends 2021. I'm glad to have you with us. It's a privilege. Thank you. I would like to quote you from another conference a few years ago when you said it is very likely that the United States will be at war with China in 15 years. This assessment made headlines all over the world, but almost three years later, we know a bit more about China. We know a bit more about the United States. And of course, due to pandemic that generated in China and hit the U.S. very hard, the world is now in a very much different situation. So. You have probably spent a lot of time thinking about the impact of 2020 on the U.S.-China tension. What is your outlook today? Thanks for the question. Uh, I was wrong when I said 15 years. I think it's five years. I'm much more concerned now than I was even three years ago in Warsaw. When I see the fact that the West has failed to adequately respond to Chinese human rights abuses with the Uyghurs, the oppression of people in Hong Kong, the continued, in fact, increasingly threatening language and activity towards Taiwan, the continued threatening activity in the South China Sea, and the fact that the West, even UK, did not really respond in a meaningful way to Hong Kong. So I actually think that the Chinese, especially the Chinese military, want a conflict. And so I think it's a possibility within five years, not a probability, but a possibility. You can come to a conclusion that it is simply impossible to fight China and win and be successful. How do you deter a country like that, a system like that, in fact? What are the ways to control it and to stop the expansion if that decision is taken? And can you tell me how to win a war with China if time comes to fight it? For instance, if it attacks Taiwan, which actually is something they are discussing in Beijing. Does the U.S. know how to do it, or does anyone know? So, Mark, for sure the United States knows how to fight. And if it came to that, it would be incredibly violent. It would be terrible. But what I think it's more important to focus on is not failed deterrence, but to think about great power competition. I believe that great power competition prevents great power conflict. And that means you have to compete in diplomacy, with information, and with the military and with economic means. And of course, the United States needs allies, it needs partners to do this effectively against China. There is zero interest and zero need. Nobody's even thinking about a land war with China on the Asian mainland. That's not what we're talking about. So when we talk about winning a war with China, what we really are talking about is protecting America's strategic interests and helping to protect the strategic interests of our allies and partners. Would you see maybe one day a NATO task force in South China Sea or elsewhere in support of Western and U.S. interests? Yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. I think that the alliance has a role for collective defense of its members to try to persuade allies to send a, a task force, for example, out to the Pacific would, number one, divert those allies from their principal task, which is collective security here in Europe, but also 
I think the role that NATO plays is to be the strong European pillar, if you will. This is what the United States is counting on, is a strong European pillar, not a European pillow. You have to continue to deter the Kremlin. If we get into a conflict in the Pacific, most or a lot of our Navy, Air Force, intelligence capabilities will all be focused there. And so we would not want, obviously, the Kremlin to take advantage of the United States being distracted. And so that's why I think the role of the alliance is to continue to stay focused here on the European continent. Now, of course, NATO has intelligence capabilities, logistics capabilities. It's a framework that is not inconsequential. But I would not want to see the alliance distracted or stretched. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Now, for sure, Canada is a NATO ally, but Canada is also a Pacific nation. The UK has Pacific interests, and so the Royal Navy, we know, is going to be a part of helping with deterrence and ensuring freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific region. The French Navy has also indicated, has already been into the Pacific, so other nations, not in support of the U.S., but in support of their own interests, will be and are operating in the Indo-Pacific region. You have just listed the capabilities that will be very much needed or indispensable in preventing China's expansion and becoming a true ally, if you will, of the United States in its new global rivalry or fight. And this is a contradiction because the maritime going countries, the naval powers of Europe, do not necessarily maintain a robust land warfare capabilities, which are, on the other hand, so much needed in the traditional role of NATO that you've just mentioned. What to do about it? How to combine the two? Well, of course, the alliance needs significant increases in the U.S. Navy, Royal Navy, Polish Navy. All of the allies have got to increase maritime capabilities to ensure that we can protect each other in the Baltic region, in the Black Sea region, and also so that we can operate across the Atlantic Ocean and in the Mediterranean. So there is a lot of water inside the NATO area of operations or responsibility. So having maritime capability is important. It's not exclusive. It's not either or is what I mean to say. I think that, of course, resources for modern navies are very expensive. It's very expensive. So we have to be smart about how we do this. Can we do more work together? I think there's a, a real future for unmanned systems, for example, smaller, more efficient. They can do a lot of the activities in the Baltic Sea that would help ensure protection for each other. Those are some things that could be done. The potential for war increases the less prepared we are. An adversary could make the terrible miscalculation. You know, the Russian, the Kremlin could say, I don't think Poland and Lithuania are really ready and the U.S. can't get there in time. So we could attack across the Suwalki Corridor, for example. That's not likely, but we want to keep it unlikely. And you do that by having large, well-trained, prepared, ready forces that are accustomed to training and operating together. That's land, sea, and air. And you have to demonstrate the ability to inflict really terrible punishment on an attacker. That's what deterrence is all about. They have to see that we are ready to unleash hell on them if they ever did attack. One of these implications of the growing Chinese problem is that Europe needs to do more. And you've just said it between the lines. I'm hearing it constantly. We're all hearing this. Can you tell me who exactly needs to do what and when and in what sense more in terms of defense capabilities in Europe? Okay, so again, within the great power competition, diplomacy, information, military and economic domains, everybody in the military would prefer that the military component backs up or supports diplomatic information and economic power. That's a critical part of deterrence. But nonetheless, you have to have hard power in order to have effective soft power. And for sure, Poland, Romania, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia have all done uh, a terrific job. I mean, really leaning forward in terms of modernization. That doesn't mean it's perfect, 
Nobody is totally satisfied. You can't rest. But in terms of commitment, that's what I see from the Polish people, and the Polish military, and the Polish government. And, of course, you see Sweden. Sweden has announced a significant increase in their defense spending. Finland and Sweden working hard on whole-of-government response. So the East Flank nations are doing what needs to be done. Where we have some challenges, number one is air and missile defense. There's not enough capability. And the Russians, I mean, President Putin brags about his hypersonic missiles and all these capabilities. And, of course, we've seen the effectiveness of unmanned systems, the drones that were on display in Ukraine and Syria, and most recently, Nagorno-Karabakh. Germany has a critical role, I think, as the sort of the transit hub for the alliance. For the United States, most everything would likely come into Germany and then move as quickly as possible towards where the crisis is or where the crisis may be. So transportation infrastructure in Germany, seaports, airports, highways, bridges, and then further across towards the east, this has got to be improved. And I think that investment in that critical infrastructure that has military purpose should count towards 2%. And the cyber protection for that infrastructure is important. The seaport at Gdansk, an excellent seaport, that is an important port of entry. So if Poland improves that seaport and has cyber protection for it, I think that should count. And this is where things like Three Seas Initiative also figure in. The idea of Rail Baltica, for example, connecting our three Baltic allies, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, with a, a rail that is common gauged with Europe, or connecting the port of Gdansk all the way down to Constanta on the Black Sea. This kind of infrastructure that would allow the alliance to move laterally is an important part of deterrence. The large transportation hub, the solidarity transportation hub between Warsaw and Łódź, that's the kind of infrastructure that's necessary for deterrence. Let's get back to the fields and forests of Europe for the final minutes of our conversation. This year will be marked by two major military operations in Europe. That is the Defender Europe 21 series of exercise by the United States and NATO allies and partners. And on the other hand, the Zappa 21 exercise by Russia and Belarus. It is the first time that the two are actually happening within a few months. They do not formally overlap, but there will clearly be some kind of interaction or maybe strategic dialogue happening. What do you expect? Well, what I expect is that for Defender 21, the United States and our allies will have a great exercise, will be very transparent, it will be declared, we'll have observers from Russia, Belarus, other countries as we did on the last big exercise in Poland that I participated in, the Anaconda exercise, where you had observers from those countries. That's what we do in the West, is we have transparency for our exercise. There'll be journalists everywhere watching everything, reporting. From the Kremlin side, I expect the usual total fabrication, lies, and false narrative about what they're doing and how big it is. I mean, they... We remember the last Zapod, they said there were only 12,000. Not even a brand new lieutenant would have believed that. But yet that's what comes from the Kremlin of a nation that claims to be a superpower and wants to be a leader in the world to lie about things like that. Uh, that's why countries that live along NATO's eastern flank are always concerned by these exercises because of the lack of of transparency. Here in Poland we concentrate obviously on this northeastern direction because Russia borders directly the NATO countries here but in terms of Russia's strategic interests it may be so that the Black Sea direction the southern part of the eastern flank is much more important because it gives the Russians much more free access to the so-called warm seas is this why Defender Europe 21 concentrates on this southern flank of the eastern flank this year? The Defender series of exercises, of course, is planned years in advance. And I believe that the concept is that each year it will alternate. So Defender 20 was in Northeast Europe last year. This year it'll be in Southeastern Europe and then it'll go back and forth. And the reason for doing that, of course, 
is to practice moving in all directions to make sure that the various seaports in the Baltic region, but also in the Black Sea region and the Adriatic are prepared to receive large American equipment or equipment from Western Europe as well. So this is a practical reason for doing this. But you are correct, Mark, as you usually are. The Black Sea region is extremely important to the Kremlin. I believe that the Baltic Sea, uh, we could achieve sea control in the early days if there was a crisis. I mean, when you think about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Denmark, plus our partners, Sweden and Finland, Kaliningrad is actually a liability for the Kremlin, assuming that we all work closely together at the right level of readiness. The Black Sea, different geography. You have three allies, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, and then you've got three partners, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, And but we don't have a strategy for the region. I don't think that Brussels or Washington appreciates the strategic importance of the Black Sea region. There is very little investment there in infrastructure. There's Western European countries do not have what I would call economic skin in the game. And so that's why you end up now with Russian troops in all three countries of South Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. I mean, that was the last corridor between Eurasia and Europe that did not go through Russia or Iran. And now you've got Russian troops there because we have not competed. We didn't put the right strategic value there. So I'm glad that the alliance is practicing in the Black Sea region. And that's also why I believe Georgia and Ukraine should both be in NATO. Let me ask you a final question about your outlook for 2021 and beyond. And let's start with the situation of the U.S. troops in Europe, specifically in Germany, where you also live. We've just heard from President Biden that he halted the planned withdrawal from Germany of 12,000 or so U.S. troops. But there will be a major global review of postures, so some relocation still may happen. How about stationing some more U.S. troops in countries like Poland? How about the Rejikova missile defense base? Is it going to be finished this year, finally? Tell me your bets. Number one, obviously, I personally was pleased to hear the announcement that any planned withdrawal of U.S. troops from Europe has been halted, placed on hold until a review is done. This is entirely normal. I would expect a new administration would automatically do a review of force structure around the world, and it'll be done in a professional interagency process with the Congress being informed and with allies being consulted. This is normal. And so, of course, as a result of that process, there may be some moving around, but I don't, I don't anticipate much, uh, much change. It is so expensive, the idea of relocating the headquarters from Stuttgart to Mons, for example. That would be billions of dollars. The idea of leaving uh, Air Force in UK instead of coming to Spangdalem would hurt readiness because the quality of the base at Spangdalem is so much better. Now, I would be happy to see increased U.S. troops in Poland, Lithuania, Romania, uh, all up and down NATO's eastern flank. I would love that. Assuming those nations wanted it, but also assuming that the alliance wanted it. General Ben Hodges, former commander of U.S. Army Europe, thank you very much for being with us. Always a pleasure to talk. Thank you very much. Dziękuję, że poświęciliście nam swój czas i mam nadzieję, że będziecie wracać do naszych audycji. Znajdziecie je w najważniejszych serwisach podcastowych. W pole wyszukiwania wpiszcie po prostu Polityka Insight. Więcej informacji o naszej konferencji i pełne nagrania rozmów znajdziecie na stronie ryzyka i trendy.pl. Chciałabym jeszcze podziękować całemu zespołowi Polityki Insight za wysiłek i poświęcenie, które włożyliście w przygotowanie konferencji. Dziękuję również naszemu partnerowi głównemu, czyli Orange Polska. Naszym partnerom E.ON Edis Energia, IKEA Polska, Microsoft i Visa. Merytorycznie wspierała nas Europejska Rada Spraw Zagranicznych oraz German Marshall Fund of the United States. Partnerem medialnym jest Radio Tok FM.